If you ain't Hobby Lobby, then where the hell you at? Well, I shop at Michael's because they're awesome, but also because they're not homophobic and they've never tried to illegally import stolen artifacts. Hello, my name is Emma. Welcome to my second channel. You might recognize me from Made in the Moment, which is my first channel. But over here, I talk about craft-related dramas. So if that's something that sounds interesting to you, then make sure to subscribe to this channel. And if you like crochet stuff, tutorials, and things like that, then subscribe to my other channel. Today, we're gonna talk about Hobby Lobby and their problematic history, to say the least. So what I'm gonna be talking about today, most of this is not like new information. This is not new stuff that has happened, but I'm just gonna be kind of going through their history and all of the crazy things that have gone down with this craft company. And I have to admit, I didn't actually know about a lot of this, at least not in detail, and not to the level of detail that I know about it now before I started this video. Even if you think you know about all of their scandals, I think this will still be a fun video and hopefully I'll uncover a couple of things that you haven't heard about. And if you know nothing, then buckle in. This is gonna be, this is gonna be kind of wild. So Hobby Lobby is a craft store. It is very similar in vibe to a Joann's or a Michael's. Basically they just have a lot of different craft supplies and home decor. Hobby Lobby is a chain. It has 1,001 stores in 48 of the United States, not Alaska and Hawaii. The craft store's little like catchphrase is live a creative life. They have that trademarked. It is founded by David Green and the Green family. I wanna take a second here to just let you know that there are a few other videos out there on Hobby Lobby. So if you're interested in learning more about the Green specifically or learning more about the whole context of this from the viewpoint of Christian fundamentalism, then I highly recommend you check out the video that Fundy Fridays made on this. They made a really great video looking at the family specifically. I'll talk about it a little bit, but in case you're interested. Another disclaimer I wanna get out of the way pretty early on, just so that it has been said, uh, there's nothing wrong with people being religious. The problem arises when it starts to impose on other people's freedoms. So when they are putting their religious freedoms above other people's ability to just like live their life and do things and exist. Another thing I wanna say is I am not trying to shame anybody that shops at Hobby Lobby or especially anybody that works at Hobby Lobby. I understand that they actually have pretty good payment and benefits plans. So it might be a good place to work for some people. Really what this is just talking about is some of the crazy things that have happened. You can make your decisions. Personally, I don't wanna be putting my money towards a business like this, but I am not going to sit here and say that you can't and you shouldn't. It's really up to you. Uh, again, I'm just telling you what has happened. The store was founded in 1972 in Oklahoma. The founder of the store was David Green, who was a preacher's son from a relatively poor background, and he opened the store actually with just a $600 loan. He opened a second store in Oklahoma City in 1975, and the next year opened the third store in Tulsa. By 1982, the store had seven locations and the first store outside of Oklahoma opened in 1984. By 1992, the chain had grown to 50 locations in seven US states. Like I said, David Green started the store with a $600 loan and now he has a net worth of $15.4 billion. According to Forbes, he is number 116 on the list of billionaires and number 45 on the Forbes 400. His net worth also doubled from 2022 to 2023 from 7.3 billion to 14.9 billion. He says that he plans to give 90% of the company to charity with the remaining amount going to family. According to Forbes, also his philanthropy score is two, which means he gives away one to 4.9% of his overall wealth. A few others in this category are Oprah and Jack Dorsey, the Twitter founder. Basically he's given more than Jeff Bezos, but less than Bill Gates and Michael Bloomberg. A little bit more background about Hobby Lobby is that they do have a pretty high minimum wage. In 2009, Hobby Lobby was one of the first retailers to establish a nationwide minimum hourly wage well above the federal minimum wage. It has since raised its minimum wage 12 times over the last 13 years. In 2014, Hobby Lobby raised its full-time minimum hourly wage to $15, that's in 2014, well before it became a trend with other retailers. We have a long track record of taking care of our employees, said Hobby Lobby founder and CEO, David Green. The store is also closed on Sundays and they close at 8 p.m. They talk a lot about wanting to allow their employees to have time to prioritize their families and their lives outside of work. As of January 1st, 2022, the Hobby Lobby minimum wage is 1850. In addition to this hourly wage, which is already above the federal minimum wage, they also provide benefits, including medical prescription and a dental plan, a 401k with generous company match, life insurance, vacation pay, personal paid time off benefits, holiday pay, 
chaplain services and an employee discount. All of that that I was just reading is from Hobby Lobby's website. So we would have to talk to some actual employees to know like what you have to do to qualify for these things. But I wanna give them credit where credit is due and to say that like, this is a good thing and more places should do this. But that doesn't mean that they are exempt from the commentary that I'm gonna make about all of the other things that have happened. So I'm gonna go through these events sort of in chronological order. There's a few things that sort of overlap and I'm going to group them in terms of like when they were resolved. So if something started earlier on, but then wasn't finished until like 2014, then I'll talk about it later on. So let's just get into it. The first thing I wanna talk about is related to the nonprofit Feed the Children. This is the sixth largest nonprofit in the world. In 2011, the founder of Feed the Children, Sue Hobby Lobby founder, David Green, claiming that the Green family was trying to push them out of the charity. So the previous owners, Larry and Francis Jones, alleged tortious interference, defamation, and civil conspiracy. Plaintiffs named in the lawsuit were David Green, his sons, Mart Green and Steve Green, his grandson, David Tyler Green, and unnamed co-conspirators. At the time, David Green had a net worth of $2.6 billion, making him the third wealthiest individual in Oklahoma. In 2009, the founder of Feed the Children, Larry Jones, was removed from his position by the board of directors. In a statement from his lawyers, it says that he was removed due to alleged unfounded claims that the organization was experiencing financial troubles, but most of the other sources I looked at say that he was fired due to hiding microphones in the offices of the top executives. He claims that some of the comments he was making were being misconstrued, and so he wanted to hide microphones to collect evidence and basically prove what he was saying was right. So Larry's lawyer says, the lawsuit filed today alleges that the termination slash removal of Reverend Larry Jones and hostile treatment of Francis Jones by the Greens and co-conspirators intentionally and tortiously interfered with the Joneses' business relationships, damaged their future economic interests and caused them to suffer emotional distress, humiliation and damage to their professional reputations. Green's lawyer, so David Green's lawyer, said that the lawsuit was financially motivated and was just an attempt to tarnish the Green family reputation. The lawsuit also alleged that David and Mart Green told Larry Jones and his wife that they planned to take over the charity and had a new president in mind. But in 2011, Larry Jones dismissed the lawsuit against David Green. Hobby Lobby's general counselor said that the Greens were completely innocent of any wrongdoing and had no intention of being bullied into a settlement by the threat or filing of a lawsuit. And that's kind of how that one wraps up. One of the other smaller controversies is uh, allegations of anti-Semitism. Apparently a shopper in Marlboro, New Jersey went to a Hobby Lobby and expressed frustration to an employee that the store did not carry any merchandise or decor associated with any Jewish holidays. In response to that, an employee says that the store does not cater to you people. Following this though, David Green issued a formal apology to the Anti-Defamation League, who then accepted it in a published statement. Steve Green also issued a statement saying that this actually was not true and the store had carried Jewish items in the past and would be planning on doing so in the future. As far as I can tell, Hobby Lobby does offer a small selection of Hanukkah items, but if you search on their website under seasonal decor and then you go to Hanukkah, there are zero products on the website. Next up, in 2012, Hobby Lobby filed a lawsuit against the United States over the right to deny contraceptives to their employees due to religious freedoms. There was an Obamacare mandate that employers had to provide health insurance that covers birth control and contraceptive care. And Hobby Lobby basically said, we don't wanna do that. At the time, David Green made a pretty lengthy statement on this. My name is David Green and I'm the founder and CEO of Hobby Lobby Stores. He talks a little bit more about the background of Hobby Lobby, which started as a miniature picture frame company called Greco Pro in 1970. He then goes on to say that his family has been an integral part of the business. Another integral part of Hobby Lobby from day one has been our faith. So he has established sort of who they are and what is important to them. And then he says, but now our faith is being challenged by the federal government. The health and human services preventative services mandate forces businesses to provide the morning after and the week after pills in our health insurance plans. These abortion causing drugs go against our faith and our family is now being forced to choose between following the laws of the land that we love or maintaining the religious beliefs that have made our business successful and have supported our family and thousands of our employees and their families. We simply cannot abandon our religious beliefs to comply with this mandate. Just a note, because I did not mention this when I was recording the video, but the abortion causing drugs that they're talking about are plan B and the week after pill. So these are not drugs that cause abortions. These are drugs that prevent abortions. They are contraceptive care and 
yeah, just thought I should throw that in there. So after Hobby Lobby filed this lawsuit, the Supreme Court rejected the company's application for an injunction, and then they sued the federal government. In 2013, Joe Heaton, a US district judge, granted the company a temporary exemption from complying with this comp contraception mandate. In January of 2014, the Center for Inquiry argued that if the court were to grant Hobby Lobby an exclusion on this, then the firm would violate the Establishment Clause. In a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Hobby Lobby's right to withhold contraceptive coverage for their employees. Basically what this decision meant was that for-profit employers with religious objections could opt out of providing contraceptive coverage under Obamacare. In the dissenting opinion, the court's four liberal judges say that this was a decision of startling breadth and that this lawsuit gives precedence that allows companies to opt out of any law that they judge incompatible with their sincerely held religious beliefs. This ended up being a really important case because this was the first time that the Supreme Court has given a company the right to hold religious beliefs. This court decision in 2014 led to widespread protests, but also inspired a group of religious leaders to pen a letter to the White House requesting to be exempt from rules preventing discrimination against LGBTQ plus groups. So basically they wanted to be able to discriminate against LGBTQIA plus groups in hiring decisions. Here is a little bit of the statement. While the nation has undergone incredible social and legal change over the last decade, we still live in a nation with different beliefs about sexuality. We must find a way to respect diversity of opinion. An executive order that does not include a religious exemption will significantly and substantively hamper the work of some religious organizations that are best equipped to serve in common purpose with the federal government. So basically they just wanted to be allowed to not hire LGBTQ people. In response to this, Obama announced that he would sign an executive order barring discrimination by federal contractors on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. So their letter and their requests to be exempt from discrimination did not get approved. Now we get into the craziest one of all. Okay, so in 2009, Hobby Lobby allegedly began collecting historically significant manuscripts, antiquities, and other cultural materials. These artifacts were intended to go to the Museum of the Bible, I don't want to talk too much about this, but to give a little bit of background on the Museum of the Bible, it's located in Washington, D.C. and owned and operated by the Green family. It was established in 2010 and opened in 2017, and it was established to chart the history and impact of the Bible. Former museum president Kari Summers said that the goal is to reacquaint the world with the book that helped make it and let the visitor come to their own conclusions. We don't exist to tell people what to believe about it. And many of the items on display in the museum were donated from the Green Collection as a tax write-off. How generous of them. The Archaeological Institute of America strongly disparaged the message of the Museum of the Bible, saying, if archaeology is being used as a means of providing the historicity and accuracy of the biblical text, that is extremely problematic. Many unprovinced antiquities surely come from illegal excavations or looting. In order to get these artifacts from the Middle East into the country, they shipped them to... Oklahoma City, in boxes labeled as ceramic tile samples. At the time, a historical expert warned them that the artifacts might have been looted from historical sites in Iraq and that failing to determine their heritage could break the law. But despite this warning, they continued anyway. In December of 2010, Hobby Lobby executed an agreement to purchase over 5,500 artifacts for $1.6 million. There were apparently a lot of red flags in this transaction that Hobby Lobby just sort of disregarded. Hobby Lobby received conflicting information where the artifacts had been stored. During the July 2010 inspection, the artifacts were displayed very informally. They were spread on the floor, arranged in layers on a coffee table, and packed loosely in cardboard boxes, in many instances with little or no protective material between them. The representative from Hobby Lobby also actually never saw the dealer who owned the artifacts or even paid him for these artifacts. Apparently, they just followed instructions from this supposed dealer. They didn't pay him directly, but they wired payment for the artifacts. This is $1.6 million to seven different personal bank accounts in the names of other individuals. In addition to all of this, all of these acquisitions that they made were not even documented well on Hobby Lobby's side. They were originally intending to display these in the Museum of the Bible. In 2017, the museum's chief curator said, we can't even tell sometimes which particular item belongs to which acquisition. Basically, they just didn't document it well at the acquisition point or when it was delivered, so they didn't even know where anything actually came from. These then were shipped to three different corporate addresses in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, with all of the packages being labeled incorrectly as ceramic tiles or clay tile samples. There were approximately 10 packages shipped in this way to the stores and the CBP intercepted five of these shipments. The shipping labels also claimed that the packages were from Turkey. 
So these shipments were intercepted between January 3rd, 2011 and January 5th, 2011. They intercepted five FedEx shipments from the United Arab Emirates to Oklahoma City. This seizure basically resulted in the 2017 civil forfeiture case, which has quite honestly the funniest name that I've ever seen. It's called the United States of America versus approximately 450 ancient cuneiform tablets and approximately 3,000 ancient clay boule. The complaint also mentions a protection for Iraqi cultural property. Property into the United States has been restricted since 1990. In 1990, the United States implemented a general ban on importation of any Iraqi goods via their Iraqi sanctions regulation. They also violated an Iraqi law, which uh, is under Article 3 of Iraq's antiquities laws. This states all antiquities found in Iraq, whether movable or immovable, on or under the ground, are considered property of the state. It also says private persons generally cannot possess antiquities. The definition of antiquities under this is anything that was made, produced, sculpted, written, or drawn by man, which is at least 200 years old. Hobby Lobby agreed to return the artifacts to their rightful home and pay a fine of $3 million. In this article by Michael Press written in 2017, he says that some people have pointed out that this incident might be a black mark on Hobby Lobby, but actually it's more like a slap on the wrist. Though they are being forced to forfeit thousands of artifacts in question, they are paying what, given the Greens family massive wealth, is essentially a token fine and serving no jail time. Even worse, the $3 million amount may not even be a fine, but a settlement for additional objects purchased by the Greens that they are not forfeiting. The Green collection includes some 40,000 artifacts. It is simply impossible for this number to have been accumulated without a huge quantity of them being looted and smuggled. A little bit of background on the tablets. They came from an ancient city called Irizagreg. I hope I said that right. The tablets are primarily from the old Babylonian period and are mostly legal and administrative documents, but they also include an important collection of early dynastic incantations and bilingual religious texts from the Neo-Babylonian period. After this came out in 2017 and Hobby Lobby agreed to pay the $3 million fine, Steve Green issued another statement saying, we should have exercised more oversight and, and carefully questioned how the acquisitions were handled. We have accepted responsibility and learned a great deal. Like, I'm sorry, you don't just accidentally smuggle 450 ancient cuneiform tablets and approximately 3000 ancient clay boule smuggle these items into the country using their retail store address. Like this out of all of the things we've talked about is the craziest thing that's happened. I don't see how you can see a company that claims to have this moral high ground uh, on other companies of like, oh, we, we compensate our employees fairly and we do all of this and we care for people and we want them to spend time with our families and, and all of this stuff. And then they are profiting off of smuggling artifacts in addition to this fine, Hobby Lobby also agreed to adopt internal policies related to the importation and purchase of cultural property to provide appropriate training to its personnel, hire qualified outside customs counsel and customs brokers, and submit quarterly reports to the government on any cultural property acquisitions for the next 18 months. For me, uh, quite honestly, 18 months is not enough. It, really, the way that all of these, these articles are talking about this is as if they just accidentally forgot to do something or that like they accidentally did something that they didn't know was wrong. This to me is very similar to when like uh, someone is accused of let's say like grooming and then they're like, well, that was 10 years ago. Like I was, I didn't, I didn't know any better. And then you find out that 10 years ago they were 30 years old and at 30 you should know better. That's very similar to me, obviously. Obviously, this is worse because this is a corporation and corporations, I think we should hold more responsible for things like this than people. And again, going back to the whole idea of our corporations people, this is an example where it's like, if a person did this, they would never get to do anything again. They would not double their net worth from 2022 to 2023. They would not get to continue operating as a craft store. Okay, so upon further consideration, I actually do think a person would be able to do all of that if they were wealthy and probably white. So we see that all the time where people who are really, really wealthy don't have the same consequences as everybody else. So that's definitely a part of it here as well. In October, 2018, the Museum of the Bible stated that five of its 16 Dead Sea Scrolls fragments are counterfeit. And in March, 2020, independent fraud investigators at the museum revealed that all 16 fragments were actually counterfeit and were ancient leather and modern inks. 
In 2019, the British Egypt Exploration Society alleged that Dirk Obink, Obink? Dirk Obink engaged in the theft and sale of at least 11 ancient Bible fragments to the Green family. After this accusation, the museum then said that it would return the fragments to the Egypt Exploration Society. In 2020, there were more stolen objects found in the museum. Steve Green announced that the museum would return 11,000 additional artifacts to Egypt and Iraq, including thousands of papyrus scraps. Green admitted, I knew little about the world of collecting. The criticism of the museum resulting from my mistakes was justified. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't spend millions of dollars collecting ancient artifacts if you don't know much about collecting. Maybe you should have listened to the expert that you hired to help you with the situation. Maybe you shouldn't have done all of this. Like, what a profound understatement. Okay, moving on to 2020. After everything you've heard up to this point, it's probably not surprising that Hobby Lobby did not have the best coronavirus response. Basically, Hobby Lobby in Colorado remained open in defiance of the Colorado stay-at-home order. Hobby Lobby basically claimed that it was an essential business because it sold supplies that people needed, like PPE and homeschooling supplies. But the governor of Colorado, Jared Polis, made it very clear that this was not the case, that they were not exempt from the stay-at-home order, he literally said, they're not exempt. <laughs> and then he said, I don't wanna have to go through and say what businesses are and are not exempt. You guys just have to like use common sense here. Like you're a craft store. I understand you wanna stay open, but at this time, this was, this was in April of 2020. This was very, very early in the beginnings. They did reopen their stores uh, fully in July of 2020. In addition to claiming that their business was essential and needed to stay open, Green reportedly wrote that the decision was informed by a message from God bestowed upon his wife, Barbara Green. In her quiet prayer time this past week, the Lord put on Barbara's heart three profound words to remind us that he's in control. Guide, guard, and groom. We serve a God who will guide us through this storm, who will guard us as we travel to places we've never seen before, and who, as a result of this experience, will groom us to be better than we could have ever thought possible before now. He said that regardless of what the future looks like, we can rest in knowing that God is in control, adding that the company may have to tighten our belts moving forward. The company did not clarify if employees would qualify for sick leave if they did get COVID. And after the store did close, many of the employees did not qualify for any paid time off. And let's talk a little bit about what's kind of going on, what's been happening recently. One of the biggest stories is of uh, discrimination against a transgender employee who was denied use of the bathroom for over 10 years. So apparently this woman, Somerville, had been an employee at Hobby Lobby for 22 years and transitioned in July of 2010. She then was written up at work in early 2021 for using the woman's restroom at her job. She'd worked at this store for 12 years at this point and had legally transitioned. She'd changed her personal records to reflect her gender and changed her name, social security card, and driver's license. And just to also make this clear, uh, any trans person is valid and deserving of respect and should be allowed to use the restroom at their job, regardless of whether they have completed these steps in their transition yet or not. She searched for a lawyer and in 2013 filed complaints with the Illinois Human Rights Commission, saying that Hobby Lobby was discriminating against her based on gender identity. They did add a unisex bathroom in 2013, but continued to refuse her access to the women's room. After 10 years of this discrimination, the appellate court finally ruled that Hobby Lobby had to allow her to use the women's restroom. The commission then agreed that the company owed her $220,000, which was the highest amount ever awarded by the commission for emotional distress. Somerville continued to work at the Hobby Lobby during this whole time. She said, why should they run me off just because they don't like who I am? She really liked working with customers and really felt like she was good at her job. So she didn't wanna leave. Another lawsuit that was settled this year, Hobby Lobby agreed to pay $50,000 to resolve a disability discrimination lawsuit. According to the lawsuit, Hobby Lobby violated the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, when it failed to allow a part-time clerk to use her service dog on the job. The company's district manager had decided that the dog would be a risk to people. Without any supporting evidence, then the clerk was fired. Another interesting thing about Hobby Lobby is that they don't have any barcodes. There are sort of stories circulating on social media about why this might be. Some people believe that it is because Hobby Lobby sees barcodes as potentially the mark of the beast. Others say that the founder just believes that humans are better at doing work than machines. Here's a TikTok I found from an employee. Side eye. Okay, so when I was 16 years old, my very first job was at Hobby Lobby. The CEO really believes in 
just like the power of humans over computers. People will say it's because barcodes are the mark of the beast and Hobby Lobby is crazy, but they are not that crazy. So any employee that works at the cash register is in charge of typing in the numbers on the barcodes and then also remembering all of the sales for the week so that they can manually insert those. Here's another TikTok about the barcodes. On any of their products, yeah. do you know why? Because of the mark of the beast. Just told me that Hobby Lobby doesn't use barcodes because they're afraid that they're gonna be used for the mark of the beast. So you wanna go check out whether this is actually true? In case you're wondering, the general story is that in- So then this TikToker goes to Hobby Lobby and sees that this is true. They don't have any barcodes. This TikTok is from August 1st of this year. And here's another TikTok from an employee. This is from June 27th of this year. In case you didn't know, every single item that you bring up to the counter, whether it's on sale or not, you have to type in the price. Then we have to type in what department it's from. Then we have to type in any discounts that are applied because they don't automatically just happen. Shout out to my fellow Hobby Lobby cashiers, you know? So they have to type in the price, type in the department, remember all the sales, all of this stuff. So yes, they're making more money, but also they have to do all of this extra work because Hobby Lobby does not have barcodes on their merchandise. Hi, did you find everything okay? Just the stuck tape? Okay, yeah, no worries. So this one is actually 85% off, is that okay? Okay. And if you're wondering what kind of products that they are offering in their stores, if you haven't been to one in a while, here are a couple TikToks showing some of the things that they have in their stores currently. And it's pretty much exactly what you would expect. One more thing I wanna bring up is that Hobby Lobby funded the He Gets Us ad campaign. You might or might not remember this from the Super Bowl. It basically was the ad that was an ad for Jesus. So they say that these advertisements are an effort to shift away from the negative public perception of Christians and more towards Jesus and that part of the story. The campaign is attempting to appeal to groups that may have felt excluded or repelled by the church in recent years, like members of the LGBTQ community, different races and ethnicities, and those who lean more liberal politically. Estimated cost of an ad in the Super Bowl is around $20 million. The branding firm for the campaign also said that they are investing $1 billion over the next three years to promote this ad campaign, which is comparable to that of a major brand, apparently. So you might be seeing more of these. Basically, this is a commercial for Jesus. This is a big deal because it's part of this big campaign that's just getting started. It's something to watch out for. Again, religion, you're allowed to believe whatever you wanna believe and there's nothing wrong with making an ad for Jesus, but knowing the the kinds of people that are funding this ad, I think it's just important context to have. And the last line of the ad is, he gets us, all of us, Jesus. To end everything on kind of a lighter note, I wanna talk about something that happened really recently that has to do with AI. So here's a Hobby Lobby adjacent controversy. It's really only a controversy because it's in their store. Basically on June 5th of 2023, an AI artist by the name of Jennifer Vin Vineyard generated these pictures using Mid Journey AI. The photos were posted in AI Art Universe, so it's in the name, AI, and they were captioned, I think we need to talk about what is going on at Hobby Lobby, dot, dot, dot. Won't somebody please think of the children? And of course the response was insane. So this was uploaded to Reddit with the caption, Hobby Lobby has a lot of explaining to do. Hobby Lobby has a crap ton of Baphomet statues. What do you think about this? Like, what's your opinion on all this? Look at that thing, that thing is, crazy that's great a lot of people saw these and didn't know that it was ai and honestly like they just looking at this with no context like they do look fairly real and then you start to think about it a little bit more and you're like why would hobby lobby have like satanic merchandise why like why would they have that and this user responds and says well i guess even christian owned companies can be bought for the right price severely disappointed jennifer says that these images took mid journey about 10 minutes to generate and the prompt was very very simple it just said something like Hobby Lobby selling satanic products and she included some pictures of a Hobby Lobby store for the generator. Here is a, a TikTok about the situation. There's some Hobby Lobbies that are across the seas that are also selling satanic things. I get it. AI is super convincing. The Hobby Lobby thing, a few things to look for in AI. You won't see anything that you actually recognize. Signage, words, nothing. This is the Target one. Target does not have that sign. 
please stop falling for this. So people were then sharing these pictures on social media and pretty much doing the same thing that they did with Bud Light and Target earlier this year, saying like, we'll never shop at Hobby Lobby again. The artist actually says that she's a member of the Satanic Temple, but does not belong to an official congregation yet. And she got the idea from a very similar post that was uh, showing AI generated satanic images in a Target in the end of May. I just thought it would be funny to use the satanic decor since Hobby Lobby pretends to be a Christian store. One Facebook user says, well, looks like Hobby Lobby will be the next company that goes out of business. I hope it loses billions of dollars. Satanic statues really buy no more Hobby Lobby. Screw satanic people, another user said in response. Look, all I'm saying is that satanic people are stupid and obviously you worse the damn devil and stuff like that and that's disgusting. I could never and satanic people can go work right really where they belong, which is hell. Funnily enough, this was actually not the first time that Hobby Lobby and the Satanic Temple made headlines together. Following the Supreme Court decision allowing Hobby Lobby the right to opt out of certain contraceptive cares in 2014 due to their strongly held religious beliefs, the Satanic Temple tested out to see how far the logic of this ruling could go. In July of 2014, the Satanic Temple took a stance regarding informed consent abortion laws. The Satanic Temple, a religious group based in New York but with followers across the country, used the ruling to fight informed consent laws which mandate that women considering abortions must be given state-approved literature about the procedure. The Satanists made moves to claim their share of liberty. The Satanic Temple, a putatively diabolical denomination, announced it's seeking a religious exemption for people who live in states with informed consent laws that require doctors to share certain information with women before they get an abortion. This sometimes includes materials about the link between abortion and breast cancer, as well as claims regarding a depressive post-abortion syndrome, the Satanic Temple claims, which they see as scientifically unfounded and medically invalid and therefore an affront to their religious beliefs. They put together a letter for women to be able to hand to their doctor and opt out of viewing the materials that are distributed prior to their procedures. According to this initiative, the Satanic Temple agreed to file a lawsuit on behalf of the person getting the procedure if the doctor refused the letter and showed them the pamphlets anyway. They cited the Hobby Lobby case as precedence for this decision. Both of these arguments rely heavily on the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act, or RFRA. RFRA was passed in 1993 and adds more protections than the Constitution lays out for religious freedom. A number of legal experts, including law professor Marcy Hamilton, believe RFRA is unconstitutional. Hamilton believes RFRA caused this wave of extreme religious liberty that is untethered from the Constitution. According to some legal experts, the Satanic Temple's argument did not really have legal backing. They were not filing a lawsuit, but rather had drawn up a letter for a person to hand to their doctor. Regardless of their legal standing, they were trying to make a point. The Supreme Court has accepted the earnestness of one group's politically controversial religious views, leaving an open question about what qualifies as a sincerely held religious belief. The ruling in Hobby Lobby was made in the context of a familiar religious tradition rather than one outside of the mainstream. The Satanic Temple has done things like this before, where they attempt to expose potential hypocrisies of the separation of church and state. One such instance was in 2014 when they requested for a seven-foot Satanic statue to be displayed outside the Oklahoma City Courthouse next to a monument of the Ten Commandments. As a result of this, litigation began in the landmark case Prescott v. Oklahoma Capital Preservation Commission, which ruled that the Ten Commandments statue was a violation of the Oklahoma State Constitution that prohibited state funds or public property from being used for the benefit of religious purposes. The Ten Commandments memorial was then taken down, and the Satanic Temple withdrew their request for their statue as well. But yeah, that's pretty much all I have. I think the biggest and craziest thing for me is all of the hypocrisy that we're seeing. Hobby Lobby wants to be treated as a person when it comes to having religious rights, but they do not want to be treated as a person when it comes to prosecution on smuggling millions of dollars of ancient artifacts into the country. You really can't have it both ways. But yeah, thank you for watching. This was really interesting to do a deep dive into. There's definitely more that I didn't even talk about. I have some more video ideas for some probably shorter videos and just little like one-off things. I've already been getting some messages from people sending receipts on certain things that have happened in the past and that they want to maybe be spoken about again. I can't do this by myself. I can't know everything and have all of the drama and information about everything. So if you have receipts or if you have something that you want me to talk about, then please send it to me because that really makes it easier for me to know what direction to look in and see what you are interested in me talking about. Like I said, I have a Patreon if you want to support me. That is through my main channel, Made in the Moment. There are additional podcasts on there. I'm planning on recording a video podcast talking a little bit about the Rico Sheehan lawsuit and the state that it's in currently. But once things have sort of progressed with that, then I'll probably make a video on this channel as well. If you like the video, like it, subscribe to my channel. I'm just starting out and any of your engagement and support really helps get my channel pushed out to the algorithms and 
sent to people that are interested in this kind of stuff. If you want to share it with your friends, I really appreciate that as well. Like I said, check out some of the other Hobby Lobby videos. Those will be listed in the description. And if you want to see my sources, those will be linked in a Google Doc in my description as well. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.